Hey, Berkeley friends. Sorry, we didn't get to get through the presentation and Q&A the other night. Uh, I still wanted to kind of come back and revisit my slide deck and hopefully present some information to you uh, that could be beneficial to you as you're considering spinning out some technology from the university or a lab or uh, have any other uh, startup ambitions. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am founder and principal of Rockridge Venture Law. Uh, we are an IP focused firm. Uh, I previously was at UC Berkeley in the tech transfer office uh, and was also at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, in their tech transfer office, uh, leading bioscience and biotech licensing activities. I left there and founded a, a licensee called Resolute Therapeutics. Uh, and that was a company with a uh, small molecule um, portfolio. Uh, we are now on a joint venture with a, with a German company called Evotech uh, under Carbex fin funding. But in parallel with uh, co-founding Resolute Therapeutics, uh, I also set up this law firm uh, with, with an interest in being sort of at the forefront in the Southeast where I'm located now uh, in Tennessee uh, of entrepreneurship around academic ideas, but as we are a B Corp law firm, we also work with a number of uh, social impact uh, entrepreneurs as well. So uh, companies that are really interested in solving some of the world's problems on the social and environmental fronts, uh, we're, we're a champion of those companies and, and, and we love doing that work. I'm also an NIH Radix faculty member, uh, which means that I, I evaluate um, proposals and, and technologies that are uh, in the medical diagnostic space, particularly those that are responding to uh, COVID uh, and uh, other similar uh, viruses that we're gonna encounter. I've also been uh, an SBIR program evaluator for the NIH and NSF as well. Um, so all that's to say that uh, I have some unique perspectives when it comes to commercializing technology from a university or from a national lab or from a hospital, kind of understand all sides to the equation, both uh, in the shoes of the licensor, the entity that claims an ownership interest uh, to that promising innovation, uh, and also to the licensee, the one who wants to go and actually make something of it. Uh, and then finally, um, from the uh, perspective of uh, patent attorney's hat. So I'm a registered patent attorney, uh, so I kind of understand how to draft claims and prosecute claims for, for the benefit um, of entrepreneurship and scaling uh, in, potential, in particular. There's some contact information for me, um, pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, that's a great place to reach out to me. Uh, there's also my, my profile uh, on the website. Uh, Rockridge, I mentioned that. Uh, we, we now have offices in Chattanooga, Durham and Nashville, but we have clients uh, all over the place. Uh, very, very connected to the Berkeley community, uh, connected to uh, communities in the Research Triangle, connected to communities up in, um, in New York and around Yale. Uh, so we have clients uh, just kind of everywhere, but, but our, our primary operation centers uh, are in the Southeast. Uh, if you've ever seen a presentation from a lawyer, you know that we love our disclaimers. Uh, so here's mine. Uh, just pretend this never happened. You never heard anything from me. It's not legal advice. It can really, really harm you and what you're going to do, uh, particularly if you're if you're watching this while riding on a scooter. So just remember that this is uh, this is not actually advice. You never knew me and we're all good. OK, so now let's actually talk. We heard a little bit from Terry uh, about IP, what the different kinds of IP are. So I'm not going to go through a very comprehensive overview of intellectual property. Um, I do want to just get some key concepts out there. Uh, first is intellectual property is not intellectual. Uh, it is a derivative of basic property law. And the real thing you need to understand, and, and Terry kind of hit it um, on the head, is uh, your intellectual property right, I like to think of it in terms of a, of a backyard. Um, you are getting a right from the federal government, whether it's a copyright, whether it's a patent right, whether it's a trademark right, whether under common law it's a trade secret right, you're getting a right to protect a certain amount of property. And let's say you have a backyard and you want to fence in that backyard. Well, the government is going to basically survey your property. It's gonna survey your property lines. If it's a patent, then that surveying is about your claim set. What are your claims? What are your rights? It's your job to build the fence 
and to actually monitor for IP infringement. Now, there are some ways that you can get government actors to act on your behalf, whether it's the Customs Bureau, uh, you can get some private in, uh, entities to act on your behalf under some laws like uh, in, internet providers, you know, Google, Amazon, entities like this uh, are subject to abide by certain intellectual property laws. But the, 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 the core idea here is that this is just a derivative of property law. If you understand that, hey, I have a right in something, I have a possessory right, you cannot have this possessory thing that I have without permission, without some sort of agreement to, you know, what I get in return for your use of this, um, then you understand everything about IP conceptually. IP is not about the mind um, necessarily. Sometimes, uh, particularly in the patent space, you can have rights that trigger when the idea is completely within one person's head. And so the, the triggering point is if if your innovation uh, is, is so formed in your mind that you can explain it to somebody else and they can go out and practice it without a lot of R&D, then you have a patentable invention in your mind and that ownership is in you. You don't have to actually develop a prototype. When you file a patent application, you don't necessarily have to have anything that you've done, you've worked out in a lab or on paper. You just need to be able to explain what it is in your head. And, and, and that's where the rights attach uh, for ownership purposes, for entering into contracts, for filing um, uh, patent applications. Uh, it, it is sometimes all within the head. Um, now, in some cases, that, that, that is not necessarily so. Um, so some aspects of the life sciences, you really need to show some additional data. Uh, we can talk a little bit about um, uh, monoclonal antibodies, for instance. You, you really need to show some, some gene sequencing if you're going to want your patent to go anywhere. Um, but uh, but the, 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 the core concept that I want you to take away is that... Um, you can have some rights that exist solely within your mind. And it's, it's good to be thinking about things early on when it comes to patent protection and, and IP protection all around before you get too far discussing with others, doing things, risking public disclosures that are going to undermine your potential IP rights. And finally, intellectual property, it is about property. Again, it's that derivative of property law. So it's about your possessory interest in something. It doesn't give you a right to go out and do it because somebody else might have prior possessory rights, but it is about the fact that you have some asset, you can attach value to that asset, uh, and you can build on top of it. And there are four general areas of, of intellectual property. You've got copyright, which we often associate with creative works, but that can also be um, source code. Uh, trademark, that's the uh, you know, that's that sort of visceral part of a source identifier. What's what, you know, how, how can I look at this particular logo or think about this name and attribute it back to some particular entity? Um, you know, for instance, if you walk into a hardware store and you see a Google dishwasher, you're going to, uh, or an appliance shop, you can see a Google dishwasher, you're going to immediately think that, oh, that's the that's the Mountain View company, Google, that's now making dishwashers and um, bet they're really smart and probably a little creepy. Um, that is because they have significant trademark rights in that name of Google and anything they that you see pop up with Google, you're going to immediately think of the company Google and that's their trademark rights, which have created that kind of value. Um, patents are where we're going to spend most of our time today, kind of kind of thinking through, uh, and then trade secrets. The the classic example is the Kentucky Fried Chicken secret recipe. This is actually protected in a vault surrounded by lasers uh, in in Kentucky in an office in Kentucky. So that's that idea that you have something, you have a special secret sauce. Maybe it's a certain adhesive you use in building a medical device. Uh, and that is something that you don't want to tell anybody about. And, and it's, it's, it's a trade secret. It's a very valuable kind of intellectual property that you're going to protect by norms and contracts primarily. Anytime that I work with uh, a company, uh, I, I always like to walk through, you know, what, what is your baby? What is this thing that you have 
um, that we need to think through what are all the ways to protect the different aspects of the innovation. So here are just some uh, illustrative examples of that up top. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite um, patent illustrations in, in recent years. Uh, this, is, this is by Google. This is a uh, fly paper for the car. So the idea behind this patent filing is that uh, when autonomous vehicles uh, hit people, um, it's not necessarily that initial impact that does the damage, but it's the car hits person, person flies into telephone pole, and then person gets really, really hurt. So the idea is that, oh, they'll just stick to the car once they get hit. Uh, and so this is, this is an actual patent filing, but this would be an example of an illustration in a patent set where you have different numbers that are showing um, different aspects of the invention and you're describing that in your patent application. And then some, at some point, you're going to create a claim set. Uh, down below that, you've got Kendrick Lamar. It's a music video. His hair's on fire there. Lots of artistic representations here. So lots of uh, copyright rights that are evident just in that image. There's, uh, there's a lot of creative visual work in the staging, uh, in the dress. There's uh, music that goes along with this. There are underlying rights in the music itself that um, is part of this video. And then there are stacks of rights that are in the actual video production uh, itself. And then a, a stock of corn. You may have um, lots of different rights uh, in corn. You could have branding rights. You could have patent rights. You could have trade secret rights. So there are lots of different rights that could go into different innovations. So the first step is just kind of identifying what is your innovation? What are all the different things that we might want to protect uh, and commercialize about it? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about entity types and how they relate back to this idea of commercializing university IP. So I know you've got this elsewhere uh, in your programmatic um, uh, workshops, but uh, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them, but just as a recap for context sake. So you've got corporations, um, that's your, your, you know, your Delaware C Corp, Public Benefit Corporation, uh, you got pass-through entities, LLCs, S-Corps, and then obviously your, your nonprofit type of entities. Um, usually when we're talking about commercializing university IP, we're dealing with corporations. Uh, the primary reason for it, that is that corporations are the most investor friendly vehicles. Uh, investors prefer corporate structures uh, for many, many reasons, and particularly Delaware corporations, because that's where the body of corporate law is, is, is really, really um, build up thorough. Most companies uh, in the U.S. and internationally who are operating in the U.S. have Delaware entity structures. Uh, don't need to go into the, the whole reason for that, but, but just know that if you're going to set something up, you may want to think about a Delaware corporation. Uh, and um, you're going to have different aspects of that corporation, even at the launch stage that you need to account for in terms of your board, who are your executives making decisions, shareholder rights, what kind of stock are you authorizing? What kind of stock are you issuing? Who's getting the stock in terms of the initial founders of the companies? What kind of stock are they getting? Are they getting stock under vesting plans? Um, are you trying to keep everybody kind of uh, attached to the company for some term before they actually get their um, the, get their, their liquidity uh, granted to them. So there are all kinds of questions that go into how you launch a company for the purpose of commercializing uh, university IP. But the, 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 the takeaway here is that you're most likely looking at a, a, at a Delaware corporation. Uh, LLCs are great if you don't think that you're going to be uh, actually asking for investment. Um, from outside investors. If you think you're going to uh, take a university technology and, and you're going to create maybe a service company, um, or maybe you've already been working as uh, an academic consultant to some companies and you have an opportunity to maybe commercialize some software that's going to be used um, for the benefit of providing services to different companies and in different industries. Uh, and it's going to be kind of a closely held company. Maybe you can get traditional debt financing. You can get bank loans. You can get government loans. You can get government grants, um, you know, SBIR grants to further development. Uh, you can do that as an LLC or as an S corp. You don't necessarily need to be a, 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 a C corp to do that. That cuts down 
uh, on a lot of the management, the administrative work, uh, cuts down on some of the costs. Uh, and so it's, it's a preferred vehicle if you're not going to be looking for actual private investment into your entity. Uh, and then lately we've seen a huge rise in benefit entities. So this would be like a benefit corporation, a California benefit corporation, a Delaware public benefit corporation. Um, these look most like C corps. They operate as C corps, but they have some additional layers of requirements um, that uh, essentially safeguard against shareholder primacy. And we can go that into that in a separate topic, but the idea is that if you have some missional aspect to the company that you're growing, and you wanna protect that missional aspect as you grow, you don't want investors who come in and change the way you do things, um, change some important social or environmental aspect to your company, change the way you wanna treat your employees, um, then a benefit corporation can protect your, as founders, your interests in how you wanna operate your company for some um, potential goodwill uh, and, and keep downstream investors at bay. In talking about how, kind of how do you launch uh, and start to grow a company uh, around university IP, um, there are basically four different categories I like to think about um, that intertwine with the gig economy that we're all experiencing, your assets, your employees, your equity and sales. Uh, and what that basically means when you're dealing with assets, the questions to think about are who are the people contributing and developing to growing this idea? Um, are we talking about owners? Are we talking about owner employees? Are we talking about contractors? How you use somebody and what their role is impacts the overall proprietary rights in what you're developing. So as an example, uh, if you launch a company and you reach out to uh, some entity to create your design screen, um, your, your design scheme, your logos, create your website, um, you know, all your brand assets, then that person as an independent contractor completely owns all of that. You pay them, you don't own it by virtue of paying them. They own it. Unless they assign those rights to you, they own all those rights. So typically in a contract for development of all of your kind of visual brand assets, you're gonna want assignment language in that contract so that they do assign it to you. It's a different case from if it's an employee. If an employee is developing all those brand assets, then the company in most jurisdictions own all of that. Um, so there's a big difference in uh, how rights are flowing to the entity based upon what's the status of the person doing the work. And that's really, really important in early stage companies to understand the nature of how those rights flow. It's going to come up in due diligence when you're dealing with investors. Uh, and it's, it's really important for, um, for, for long-term growth. Leave the organic stuff to Whole Foods. Um, make sure that you are entering into contracts. Uh, it's great to have everything be warm and fuzzy and, hey, let's do this stuff on, an, on good faith, on handshake, but make sure you have some written documentation. Uh, even email writings, everything in writing are better than nothing. Um, contracts are always best, uh, but, but just make sure that you're not being too organic with how you're dealing with um, among founders, uh, among friends of founders, among um, you know, uh, family investors, uh, really get contracts in place. Uh, employees. Um, California has some pretty strict employment laws. Uh, even founders technically are supposed to be paid by the company. Uh, interns need to be paid by the company. Uh, you need to understand who is doing what work uh, and make sure that you're legally compliant there. Uh, you don't offer some sort of e open-ended equity to anybody uh, in terms of hey, you can, you can do this work for our startup and you're going to get you know, some kind of uh, equity um, uh, stake in that. You know, make sure that it's really, really locked down tight what you're promising anytime you're dealing with equity. Uh, and understanding you know, how your confidential information, um, your marketable information can be protected. Uh, can it be protected if you're working with an independent contractor? Can it be protected if you're working with an employee? What are the limits to non-compete? 
Um, if you know, we're using somebody in our company and uh, we have to terminate them or they leave, uh, what information can they take with them? Um, what do we own? So it's really understand, uh, important to understand you know, what you're getting uh, out of those employees. Um, equity. Uh, make sure if, if you're asking for money from someone and promising equity, make sure you understand that this is a long term dance partner you're entering into a relationship with. Don't do that arbitrarily. Uh, make sure that that person who's giving you some money can actually contribute to the long term um, vision. Uh, make sure that you understand the administrative aspects of taking money in from anybody, um, from, from uh, you know, having them on a cap sheet long term. Uh, this is why I, I really discourage use of crowdfunding platforms in terms of shareholder crowdfunding platforms, because you're opening yourself up to you know, lots and lots of shareholders. Um, and that could be an administrative nightmare uh, that, that's not worth it in terms of the small funding investments that they might be making. So really understanding who is it that you're taking on as an as an early stage investor, um, and you know, make sure that you're you're giving them as little as possible. Uh, and when in doubt, it is a security offering. There are state security laws um, that go to the residents uh, of the individual who's investing. There are federal securities laws. Um, fortunately, those laws have been loosening uh, over the past few years to allow. Um, less administrative burden when you are taking on uh, small investors, early stage investors. Um, you can you can raise up to higher and higher limits uh, without a whole lot of formal legal documentation. But all of these laws at the end of the day are for the benefit of the investor. Uh, the SEC, uh, state securities institutions, they operate for the benefit of investors. They don't want to see investors get fleeced. Um, and so you need to be sure that you're doing things correctly whenever you're offering uh, any, even in a pitch competition. Um, you can even violate some of these securities laws in pitch competitions if you're not careful. Uh, and then just thinking about patient capital, capital that is not for the near term turnaround, capital that is for the long term haul. And there are lots of different investors um, who are also concerned about the impact that you're going to make with your technology, not necessarily just the the uh, the early ROI potential that's there. And make sure you consider those patient capital alternatives um, that are much more interested in seeing uh, an innovation um, reach as much broad potential as possible, uh, rather than just a um, an early turnaround um, or a really high exit. Uh, and then, then finally, sales. There are things to think about in terms of um, how you're branding whatever it is that you have, how you're gathering information. Um, if your technology is really consumer product oriented or um, uh, consumer information oriented, uh, then there are a lot of privacy laws that can apply to your company. Um, there are lots of brand laws that you're going to want to think about. Um, there are consumer protection laws that you're going to want to think about. Uh, and these go similar to the security laws to the benefit of where the person is located. Um, so really having a good understanding and a, and a plan for how you're dealing with data and privacy type of information, because uh, California was the first state in the U.S. to, to pass a, a comprehensive um, privacy law. Uh, uh, and now they're sprouting all over the country. So you've got different laws in different states. At some point, there's going to be a federal privacy law um, that's similar to the GDPR in Europe. Uh, but you need to take into account those different privacy laws and make sure that you're getting into the right practice early on. Um, and this is even, you know, who might be doing the marketing and the branding for you. You're ultimately going to be responsible for the work that they're doing. Um, so making sure that you have that, that covered. All right, so now let's talk a little bit um, more specifically about working with a university in terms of licensing and commercializing. Um, so I try and uh, just encourage you to remember, um, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, uh, but you're, you're swimming in a swarm of stakeholders. As, as you are commercializing a university technology, um, you are responsible to the university because they own the IP in most cases. 
but then you're also responsible to your investors, uh, your employees, um, to to the community around you that may uh, be impacted by uh, your contracts or your activities. So there are a whole lot of stakeholders behind the university, and it's important to remember that and plan for that accordingly. I have a little reference here to MIT versus UCB. So this is um, in reference to the CRISPR dispute uh, between MIT and Berkeley um, that went on for several years. Uh, and essentially, you had both institutions claiming priority uh, in CRISPR innovations in both universities, which had outlicensed their CRISPR innovations to many, many companies or to one company that then sublicensed to many, many companies. So you had a whole lot of dependent company interests on this core battle between these universities over who had prior rights. Um, and that's, that's really, really important because you want to protect yourself as a company. You don't know what's going to happen in terms of, you know, the, the university potentially getting into an unforeseen dispute with another university. Um, this also happened one time between uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Slack, where there was a dispute um, over the IP uh, based on disclosures made back and forth. And so they were not both considered part of the Department of Energy. They were both considered different respective entities. Uh, not only do you have some institutional potential for dispute, uh, the, the patent landscape is such that uh, any patent can be challenged. I just had a, a federal circuit case recently where uh, six patents were issued just a few years ago. Uh, and as soon as all those patents were issued and were asserted against other companies, um, those companies immediately moved to have all those patents invalidated. And, and we're talking about some big companies. So they were Amazon, Twitter, um, uh, uh, Google. So these, these were some, some big companies who were involved in, uh, in the dispute. Um, but all six patents were, were invalidated uh, in district court, even though they had just been issued by the patent office. So um, that's in the district court space. That's that's you know after patents are fully authorized and registered by the patent office. But even within the patent office, you can have challenges uh, along the course of prosecution. Uh, and a really important statistic to be aware of um, is that in these IPRs, these are essentially those those patent challenges while a patent is undergoing prosecution at the patent office. 63% um, of them uh, under the new patent law uh, have, have resulted in invalidated claims. Um, so these are, uh, you know, uh, potential cases where uh, a patent is challenged at the patent office during prosecution or immediately after prosecution, uh, and they can result in loss of rights. Um, and so, you know, you, you will always potentially... Um, have to take into account the that your licensed patent from the university could be challenged uh, and that you need to start thinking about how do you build your own proprietary patents um, on top of or independent of that university IP. Uh, Know-how is a thing. Um, here's a little excerpt from an article. You can go look it up. Patents are designed to convey, not to convey scientific knowledge, but to provide legal protection. It's not obvious whether antibody information for patent documents such as antibody sequences is useful in conveying engineering know-how rather than as a legal reference only. Uh, know-how is, is really, really important. When you are uh, entering into a license with the university, um, their position is always going to be know-how is something that we don't own. Um, or, you know, uh, know-how at the university means um, that information must be published. You know, we're not a we're not a sort of trade secret type of uh, place. We're a, we're a, we're an open dissemination of information type of university. You often hear that, but there's a lot of gray area in between. Um, just because you get patent rights, don't necessarily mean you have rights to how to actually further develop the IP. Um, what really makes it work? Sometimes there are little tricks in the lab. Um, there are little processes. Uh, there are abilities within certain individuals that just having the license to the patent um, 
it's not going to get you there. You need to have some further contribution uh, from somebody at the university, somebody within the lab uh, to really make the technology work um, like it needs to. And the university oftentimes doesn't want to admit that that is a need. Uh, but attorneys in negotiations are often looking for not just the piece of paper, not just the patent rights, but we also need some sort of access. Um, we need to be able to, uh, to, to best understand how this thing works that we're licensing. And so they're often going to want to contract for some sort of know-how rights or some sort of access to the lab or to people, um, or maybe even certain, um, uh, instrumentation, uh, at the university to really make something work. So this might be, uh, a source of dispute, negotiation, um, you know, discussion, uh, or just backdoor understanding. Uh, I, I had a, um, a case one time uh, where uh, someone once told me, uh, I was asking about um, uh, patent rights, or I was really invited to a call uh, between a PI and a, and a company um, that was a prospective sponsor of a research center. And the, the issue of IP came up. The company wanted to know, well, how do we really get access to the IP? Uh, and the PI said, oh, don't worry, we're, we're, we're a no IP research center. We, um, we don't file and we don't disclose anything to the university. Our students just during the summertime, they come work for you um, and then they disclose to you during their summer work um, and then you own the patents. Uh, and it works for everybody because the, the students, they, they get jobs, you get the IP, um, you know, we get funding from you and it works for everybody. Well, <laughs> that's something that you want to just sort of do the earmuffs thing um, as, a, as, a, as a university employee. Um, but that is sometimes how it works. It's about, you know, how do you get access to the know-how um, that, that really makes something work without allowing sort of that documentation to get in the way. So if you are um, spinning out a technology from a lab, they're, they're good, you're, you're probably going to be talking to your lawyer about, well, how do I get, you know, to do this stuff, to get access to the data, to get access to the information, to get access to the tricks beyond just the patent rights or what's in the patent application, because it may not all be written out clearly in the patent application. And that's something that you want to take into account when, when working with the university. Um, another thing I encourage you to do is actually read the Bayh-Dole Act. So this is what the university says uh, is the basis for why they act like they do. Um, and it is, it is true. Uh, this is a federal law that has a clear set of requirements for the university that says if there's $1 federal funding in $999 of private funding or state funding, then any subject invention is going to be governed by this law, by this federal law, which says the federal government owns it. Federal government owns it. If $1 of federal funding goes into an invention, federal government owns it. Now, you as a university you can get those rights. We're going to grant you those rights, but there's a quid pro quo. The quid pro quo is that you have to then file a patent application on the technology and then make efforts to commercialize it. And so that is what the university says we have to do. We have to file a patent application. We have to alert the federal government that we're going to do that. Um, and then we have to find somebody who's going to commercialize this. So that that's the whole dance that they're doing with you and saying, you know, we're filing an invention, um, but you need to then license the invention from us. You need to basically compensate us for filing that application to keep this thing alive and to allow it to be commercialized. So that's why we're going to look for certain funding in the license agreement. Um, for you to cover those costs. Uh, and so just kind of understanding if you're going to enter into a negotiation with the university, um, read, read through this section. It's not long and it's not super dense. Uh, anybody can kind of figure out what this really means um, and, you know, what the university's position is going to be on this. I think the things to focus on here, and I, I excerpted them so that you would understand what you're dealing with, is 
the language here is conceived or first actually reduced to practice. And what that means is if it's conceived at the university and it's not actually reduced to practice until it's within a startup company, for instance, then it is a subject invention. And what does that word conceived mean? Well, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned at the outset. It's so formed in your mind that interests trigger, those rights trigger. Um, you've got an invention. It should be disclosed to the university because it's formed enough to where you can explain it well and others would understand that you've got something new there um, that is innovative over the prior art, over the background technology that exists. That triggers a right to disclose to the university under the federal law. Um, now, is the university going around taking polls on who's conceived something? No, but that is why they do try and encourage in any invention disclosure, even if you haven't actually developed something, because they have a legal requirement to do that, to try and make sure that if a university employee conceives something, then that's disclosed, even if there hasn't been any overt effort in developing that idea. Um, and then at that point, the university can decide, OK, well, we're going to we're going to file a patent application now because we think there's enough here to file an application or we file a provisional kind of a baby application and allow a little bit more time for this to be developed, or we're gonna pass on this. We don't think that there's a conception yet. We don't think that we need to alert the federal government that there's an invention. We don't feel that we need to file an application on this yet, um, and we want you to further develop this. So that's where all of this kind of comes into play in terms of what does this language mean um, and, and what are the university's interests? You wanna have a strategy uh, when you're dealing with a university license. Are you gonna be marrying the IP into a single product with a whole bunch of other IP? Uh, is this IP gonna be attached to, you know, maybe something else you in license or you're gonna further develop something? I mean, you, you've probably heard the, the, the saying that in, in your smartphone, there are 10,000 patents. Um, well, that's true. So, you're going to have a whole lot of different inventions in most cases that go into a consumer product. There are some areas where that's not the case. Um, life sciences tend to be uh, the best example of that, where you know a single patent or single family of patents can cover an entire product, uh, and and so there are there are certain um, times when that's not the case, but. Your university license is often going to focus on one particular invention and the royalty rates, um, the license fees, everything that is embedded in that contract is going to go to that one invention. So if you're combining that with other inventions into an ultimate product, then that might limit or certainly should limit the amount that you pay to the university in light of all those other innovations that go into that product. So thinking through ultimately, is this, is everything going to be built on top of this in, in invention or is there going to be, is this going to be one of several different inventions, several different patent applications, for instance, that go into what's actually going to be sold to the public? Um, thinking through where you need to commercialize this thing uh, in the life science spaces, there are some, some key countries where you know you're going to want IP protection, you know, places like, uh, India, China, certain countries in Europe, the U.S., certain countries in South America. Um, but you can you can look up this information. There's a lot of information out there publicly available to kind of understand uh, where do people usually file? Where are they, the, the markets that you want to capture? Um, where are the places where you stand the best chance of actually enforcing your patent rights? Uh, uh, as you, you might, um, uh, you know, maybe intuitive for you, but there are certain countries that uh, are much better at enforcing foreign IP protection than others. So thinking through, you know, where, where do you need to file and what's that going to cost? Do you have multiple sub-licensing opportunities? Um, you can split up an invention according to all kinds of different limitations. So you can say, well, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to sub license 
uh, our licensed patent from the university in these particular industries um, to you know X, Y, and Z companies, or we're going to break it up geographically. Uh, you know, company A is going to have commercialization rights to Asia. Company B is going to have the rest of the world. Uh, so, so you can think in terms of, you know, what, how do you want to sub license these things? Because your, your university license agreement is going to anticipate that you may be sub licensing. And the sort of default position of the university or lab is going to be, well, if you're sub licensing, um, then you're probably getting some additional value from what was ultimately our creation at the university. So if you turn around and flip something into a sub license for a whole bunch more money, then we need a cut of that. So they're often going to have some sort of reach through royalty rights or reach through payment rights um, and understanding how to negotiate that properly uh, to both recognize that interest at the university, but also to make sure that you're not paying what you don't need to pay. Uh, if you've licensed something and you've done a whole lot of work to get it to a place, even just connections, even just having the right investor that then introduces you to different opportunities, and maybe you have you know, a joint venture or sub-license agreement to a larger pharma company, um, and you're getting some you know, big upfront fee to enter into that sub-license, making sure that you understand the value that you put into that versus just the value of the technology on its face and the patent filings, um, and making sure that you're anticipating what that's going to look like in your agreement with the university. Um, making sure that you can kind of understand what the university tech transfer office's motives are. Uh, there is some flexibility. Once you have filed a patent application as you're required to under federal law um, to protect and commercialize the invention, there, there also is this interest among different tech transfer offices about what's their culture? What do they care about? Uh, do they care about royalties? Do they care about um, spinning out a lot of startup companies? Do they care about uh, jobs? They want to see their licensees grow and employ a lot of people. Um, you know, what is their ultimate motive? What do they care about? What do they want to brand their office as doing? Uh, and making sure you understand that and there you can talk that talk with them to say, hey, well, if you cut us, you know, if you give us some flexibility here on royalty fees, then we're going to be able to accomplish X, Y, or Z. Um, and that's ultimately going to go into, you know, whatever your metrics are, whatever the things you care about. Um, so making sure you can talk that talk with them. Don't be ignorant. Um, it's not bliss. When, when you are preparing an invention disclosure, you're asking for, say, university funding, uh, make sure you understand what the competitive landscape is out there. So one of the things that I do is I, we, I work with universities to evaluate um, some of their inventions. So, so universities who have uh, innovation centers, for instance, um, University of North Carolina, they have Eshelman Institute for Innovation, and they have an internal fund where they will fund uh, you know, potential scientific disclosures to advance them a little bit further to the point of commercialization, whether it's becoming a licensable invention or becoming um, a spin out uh, of, of the innovation center, they have this in, internal funding opportunity to be, and this is open to, to uh, PIs outside of UNC. So think about that. Um, but so they, they hire our firm to kind of look at the disclosures and see like, okay, well, what's the competitive landscape out there? What is the, you know, the patent space look like for this disclosure, because oftentimes there's none of that language in a disclosure. Uh, and so a tech transfer office is going to want to make decisions um, based upon you know, how strong your invention is compared to what else is out there. Uh, and, and, and make sure that you provide them with some of that characterization uh, so, that, so that everybody's kind of on the same page in terms of, you know, what is this? What's the potential? Uh, before you, you're spinning your wheels, you're spending a lot of time that you don't need to, to, to spend. Um, 
You're not getting obviousness rejections in the patent office when you could have avoided those by just drafting the claim set properly to get around prior art. Uh, so give the, the, give the innovation office as much as possible um, in, your, in your invention disclosures. Um, are you a brand builder? Understanding that sometimes it's not just about the patents. I've got you know a couple of uh, case studies here at the end of this um, uh, presentation, but uh, can you actually build your brand as well uh, as working on just the technology development? Because branding is important even in government uh, proposals, even in SBIR grant proposals building that brand, building that narrative of what is your technology? What is your company? What are you going to do? Uh, making sure you understand that component. Uh, use PR to your advantage. If you've got a lot of um, really nice PR around, hey, this, this company is a university licensee, that's actually going to work to your advantage. Um, if you need to renegotiate your license down the road, uh, if you've built up some uh, other IP, um, that the university has questions about down the road. Uh, you, having a lot of PR in place early that says, hey, this is, a, this is a company that the university is championing, is promoting. We're really proud of this relationship. Um, the fact is that uh, it's human nature. That they're not going to want to undermine you institutionally after they've already sort of committed to building you up like that and building up their relationship with you like that. Um, so if you have some some PR, you have some university PR in particular um, around your company, around your licensing of the technology, uh, then that can help you down the road if you if you need to renegotiate, if you need to pivot, if you need to ask for an extension, maybe you need to extend out an option agreement another six months to continue building that um, that sort of case proposal uh, for licensing for getting investment. Um, then having good good early stage PR is really going to help you in that. Uh, and then understanding how you can develop proprietary IP. So here's an example. Um, oftentimes in the pharmaceutical space, you're going to have a patent filing on a whole class of potential um, potential molecules that are effective. Uh, and your subsequent filings, your subsequent patent filings are going to be on uh, you know, maybe it's pro drugs, maybe it's down selecting that family to choose a particular, um, uh, you know, molecular composition. Uh, it is method of manufacturing. These are all going to be downstream IP filings from that first IP. Um, make sure you, you are planning on that and you are trying to identify ways that that is proprietary to your company as a startup above and beyond the core IP filing um, that was disclosed to the university. Uh, because that's also going to help you in positioning and, and understanding what royalties need to go back to the university, what fees need to go back to the university, uh, and understanding where your contribution is after entering into that license. So just having an early stage strategy for that um, is really important. Okay, so now we're going to go through just a few case studies, just throw some concepts out there for you. Um, I, I really like this. This is a gravity blanket. So essentially what this is, um, a company, a, a design firm uh, decided that, hey, we, we've, you know, the, the, these, these ideas of weighted blankets for kids have been out there for a long time. Um, uh, 20, 30 years, you've seen these weighted blankets. They're basically just quilted blankets stuffed with polyesterine beads and uh, and they they have some weight, and so kids who have sensory um, sensitivities, kids with uh, autism, they really like that compression. They like to be hugged uh, at night, and so it's a popular product for families who have who have kids who have these um, these these kinds of concerns. And uh, so for years, you know, all these all these sites out there that sell them have marketed these towards uh, kids, or market them towards parents, and all the imagery is of you know, happy kids and, um, and snuggled up little kids with, you know, short little blankets. And, and so this, this, fir this, this group of entrepreneurs basically said, you know what, we have, we have friends. I mean, we have, as parents of kids with these blankets and we have friends who they're always stealing these blankets from the kids. They love them. And none of these sites really market towards adults. And I think we can create a market opportunity if we just brand these things 
towards adults. And so they came up with this idea, Gravity Blanket. They made a Kickstarter video, a fun little Kickstarter video, and they hope to raise about $10,000 on Kickstarter. And in, instead, it was so, I mean, it, it, it just connected with so many people that they, they raised something like three or four million dollars uh, because they had a great concept. You know, it, it wasn't innovative. There was nothing patentable about what they were doing. They had a great name um, and they just really hit. Uh, they struck a nerve and, and they identified a market opportunity. Um, this is the point here is that there, there, there are always opportunities, even in saturated markets. And branding is extremely powerful. Uh, and name can really be iconic, so make sure you're protecting it. What happened with Gravity Blanket? They did file their trademark application, um, fortunately, because as soon as this video was very, very successful, other entities tried filing trademark applications on that phrase, Gravity Blanket. Um, fortunately, the company behind Gravity Blanket was there first. Um, but had they not been, had they just forgotten to do that or, or thought, you know, this is not a priority, they, they would have lost out on the rights to their name um, or lost some significant rights to their name because of this, uh, this other entity who came and swooped in and then tried to claim rights to the name. So making sure that um, you're taking account of that, uh, you know, a trademark can be just as valuable, even more valuable um, than a patent in, in many spaces, particularly in the consumer product space. Uh, and the other thing is crowdfunding platforms, they can be great beta testers. Um, we have clients who they launch every new product on a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter because they don't have to invest in having that product made at the outset. They basically get early stage commitments that they can then use to go make prototypes and they have prototype testers. A lot of people who fund things on Kickstarter, um, they're okay if it's not perfect when it shows up because they know they've basically funded a prototype. Uh, and so there's this, there's this feedback loop that you get um, as well. So it's this amazing thing for developing products and then, and then really offsetting all the risk behind that um, and then crowdsourcing the risk. So thinking about that, whatever your, 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 um, if it's not a technology, if it's more of a consumer product play, um, just recognizing that potential. Um, I have this on here just because it's really interesting. The AARP, uh, American Association of Retired Persons, they are a nonprofit, but it was really interesting. You read this in their annual revenue filings. Um, they, they report over a billion dollars, B, uh, in IP royalties. So what AARP does is they go out there and they... They negotiate all kinds of relationships with, um, you know, uh, like uh, uh, travel entities, hotels, things like that, where they are um, basically saying, hey, if you're an AARP member, you can get a discount at, at you know, this or that. And, and so as part of that, they're basically licensing out their trademark rights. Um, and then they get over a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, on a yearly basis from those IP royalties, even as a nonprofit. So just thinking about how powerful that, that name can be and how powerful IP licensing contracts can be. Uh, and finally, this one's kind of interesting to me. Um, so this, I, I actually came across this when I was at Lawrence Livermore Lab um, uh, because we, we actually tested um, this vaccine there. Uh, this, this company, New Link Genetics, it was just a small, uh, they're basically an IP investor in Iowa, a small group that go and acquire rights to different things. Um, and they acquired the rights to this vaccine from the Canadian government, uh, because yeah, in, in, in the mid two thousands, when, when the technology had been developed, there was very little, um, uh, at least perceived risk. Uh, that 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 an outbreak like Ebola would make it to Canada or would really need to be held by the Canadian government or could be commercialized in any way. Um, so this group was able to purchase uh, the rights to it for a little over two hundred thousand um, dollars, even though the Canadian government had invested five million dollars into the development uh, after the West African outbreak. Uh, New Leak flipped the vaccine to Merck for fifty million dollars and royalties. So um, the 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 takeaway here is timing is everything. Sometimes it's all about 
what's what you know what is the market doing what's the potential um what's the perceived value of of the innovation that you've developed um so so making sure you kind of understand the timing of the market space and and are not overly obsessed with the idea of the technology itself um but but considering it within the 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 grander scheme of can something be commercialized um can there be significant investment uh, potential, um, and and you know how does this work exactly? And one of the driving uh, forces for the Ebola vaccine development in the U.S. was that the federal government basically said we're going to indemnify all pharmaceutical companies who work on developing an Ebola vaccine. Um, so they essentially said, hey, if this thing, uh, you know hurts somebody, we're going to, we're, we're going to indemnify you. Um, we're going to cover the claims for that. So, and that's, that's just a huge stamp of approval, um, and can change a lot of the investment metrics for uh, potential licensee uh, or co-development partner. So just understanding the market space really well, um, in what you can do, uh, with your technology. So that's kind of um, everything that I wanted to talk about uh, just uh, in leading up to the Q&A, which obviously we, we can't have now uh, because we got Zoom bombed. But uh, there's my contact information. Uh, uh, I am an advisor for several different entrepreneurship centers, um, First Flight Venture Center uh, in Durham, um, Yale Sci City, uh, uh, BPAP. I'd love to be available uh, if, uh, if any of you want to talk through anything. Um, happy to happy to s schedule some time to um, to just have a little talk and brainstorming session with you for how you might develop something um, coming from the university or from from Lawrence Berkeley. So uh, reach out to me. Uh, thank you very much. It's it's uh, been an honor to to kind of connect with you, and I, I hope to make more relationships going forward. Bye.